Welcome to our Praise and Power Hour. And please feel free to join us Sunday mornings for our worship service at 10.15 a.m. on Epiphany Lane in our new handicapped accessible facility. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength in need is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find Thy power and Thine alone Can change the leper's spots And melt the heart of stone Jesus paid it all All to Him I owe died my soul to save my lips shall still repeat Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as
in case I haven't done so already, welcome to Calvary. Those of you that are visiting and checking out a place for a church home, I hope that you're already sensing that the Spirit of God is active and working in the hearts of people who are humble before him, that without him we can do nothing. This is all about Jesus and all about his presence. Let's pray. Father, open your word to us now, not just with eyes that see knowledge to be filed somewhere in the immense capacity of our brains, but open our hearts so that the knowledge transforms us into the character of Christ. And we pray this in your name, amen. We are uh, second week now into a series on what difference does it make. And we defined it last week as what? <laughs> that was funny. That was funny. <laughs> I know it wasn't. <laughs> I know some of you were here. What's it stand for? Inner transformation. The inner transformation of Christ. We got to experience someone who experienced the inner transformation of Christ this morning, right? They've been transformed from someone alienated from God to someone who is a part of eternal life in Jesus Christ. They've had an inner transformation. And so what we're discovering this week from Col or this month rather from Colossians is what difference does it make? What difference does an inner transformation make? And we talked last week just about what that inner transformation is. Today, we're going to specifically apply the principles of that inner transformation that Paul gives us in Colossians chapter three to the home. What difference does it make in the home? Now, you all know that the home in general in our world is in radical need of repair. Uh, it, for many, homes don't even exist. And if they do exist, they exist a long way removed from how God designed the home to exist when he first created Adam and Eve. Would you turn with me, please, to Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 12, and we're going to stand as we read verses 12 through 21. We read this last week, but we need to review and put it into the context of the home. Colossians 3, 12 through, it says 20, but it's actually 21. Reading from the English Standard Version, Paul says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Please be seated. What difference does an inner transformation make in the home? The home is the single most important social institution in the world. 
It's the single most important institution in the world. Marriage and the home are God's idea. They were instituted at the beginning of the world and at the beginning of man's existence. They were instituted by God, ordained by him, to be the foundation of all culture and society. Family life did not evolve. Family life was created when God created Adam and Eve. And the breakdown of God's design for the home is, and I am not afraid to back this up with historical proof, the breakdown of God's design for the home is the basis for and the cause of all social collapse. The breakdown of the home according to God's pattern. For if the knowledge of truth does not become the reality of faith resulting in transformational living in the home, then what hope is there for society? What hope is there? And so we need to talk today about how the presence of Christ brings hope to the home. This inner transformation that we talked about last week where you can be transformed from being a follower of self, of the world, under the control of fleshly influence, to being a follower of Jesus Christ with an inner transformation that changes and gives you a whole new set of want-tos, gives you a whole new set of desires, a whole new set of standards, a whole new set of conduct, not because you are forced to be and obliged to obey a particular law, but because the law of Christ himself has been written in your hearts and it explodes out of you all over everybody else because you've been transformed. And if we have the presence of Christ in us, then the presence of Christ will bring hope to our homes. Let me point out what this passage of Scripture teaches about that. First of all, there'll be a new purpose in our hearts. There'll be a new purpose in our hearts. Did you notice that the uh, verse 17 in Colossians chapter 3 says this? And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Does that sound like a new purpose to you? Sound like a new way of living your life? Does that sound like a new set of attitudes and actions all tied up into a voluntary response to what the transformational power of Jesus in your life is doing? You will, at that point of having the experience of that inner transformation, all of a sudden have this passionate desire created by the Holy Spirit within you to do everything in word or deed to honor the one who saved you, who paid it all for you, to whom you have surrendered. That's the new purpose that there is in our hearts. But if there's going to be a new purpose, we must put that in contrast to what the old one was. And if you back up in Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 11, we have the list of all the things that were a part of the old purpose of our lives. And it says this, put to death, therefore, whatever is earthly in you. Whatever is earthly in you. Look at the list. Put to death sexual immorality. You want to tell me that there's no relationship to the peace and the comfort and the joy and the hope of the home when husbands sit on their computers at night looking at pornography and then begin to treat their wives with disdain because they don't measure up? You want to tell me that that doesn't destroy the home? You want to tell me it doesn't destroy the home when women because they say that their husband doesn't talk to them enough and doesn't communicate with them well enough and doesn't support them well enough, start having coffee with other co-workers at work because he talks to me, he understands me. You want to tell me that that's not sexual immorality and that you're changing your loyalty and your commitment to the one that you love and that that's not going to destroy the home? Paul says put to death all of these things 
that are contrary to how the home is supposed to be patterned after God's plan, put to death sexual immorality, impurity, passion, and evil desire, put to death covetousness. You know what that word means, covetousness? It means to want something that isn't yours, to covet something, to set as a goal something that you don't have yet, but you think you need it in order to be complete. So you have made that the idol of your fullness as a human being when Jesus Christ is supposed to be all in all, for all, to all. He alone is the God who provides that. Put away anger and wrath and malice and slander and obscene talk and lying. And we could spend a whole sermon just talking about each of those things and we're not going to. The Holy Spirit is convicting you right now about anger or wrath or malice or slander or obscene talking or lying. <laughs> there, there are no white lies to God. They're all black. They're all corrupt. They're all sin. And so if there's going to be a new purpose in our heart to do whatever we do in word or deed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by giving thanks to him as we do it that this is the product of his life in me in this inner transformation, this is that new purpose in my heart that's coming out, it means the shedding of all of that old stuff and the intentional decision and choice of our lives to say no to any of it. Not to say no to just some of it, that some of it's okay to still be there, but to say no to all of it. There has to be a new purpose in our heart, and there will be if you've experienced it, the inner transformation. There's a new purpose in your heart. But not only is there a new purpose in your heart, but there's a new power to have harmony. There's a new power to have harmony. Did you see that in the passage? He says, above all of these things that you're going to put on, you're going to put on love so that you can live together in perfect harmony. Let's look at what the Holy Spirit puts in the place of all the things that we have just put to death. Here's the list. This is what he says. The Holy Spirit is going to produce the character of Christ in you. There's this new power that has come into your life. It's the power of the eternal God himself in the person of Jesus Christ through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit who begins to bring the very character of Christ to your life so that now instead of experiencing anger and wrath and malice and covetousness, you're experiencing compassion compassion for other people. When we mentioned the Philippines this morning and we mentioned Karin, some of you were filled with compassion for what Karin must be experiencing and what she must be feeling, not having any contact with her family back in the Philippines, knowing that they were right in the heart of that storm and they may not even be living right now. Some of you are broken by that. Some of you aren't because you're thinking about what are you thinking about other than having the heart of Jesus Christ compassionately for people who are in prison or jail for their families who won't get to have Christmas presents this year and we talk about Bethlehem's treasure and the compassion of your heart swells up and says I can't wait until I get details so I can buy some presents for a family who won't have Christmas because dad or mom is in prison or jail. Are you allowing the character and the nature of Christ to so fill you that these characteristics are becoming the new pattern of your life? compassionate hearts, kindness and humility and meekness. Meekness does not mean weakness. Meekness means to have all of the power that you think you have under the control of the Holy Spirit's power of your life. It's to have power under control. The, old, the, the Greek word actually comes from a term that was used to describe the bridling of horses in the old Greek culture. The horse had not lost any power, it's just the power had been brought under the control of a bit and a bridle so that the rider could control it. Is God able to control all of your power because you've surrendered all of your authority to your life and all the power of your life, you've surrendered it to the master? That's what meekness is. 
doesn't mean you lose any power. It just means now the power is harnessed for a new purpose. What about patience? Can you imagine how homes would be changed if patience was lived out in the people who call themselves Christians? <laughs> patience? Oh, but I gotta have it fixed right now. Please take care of that. You know how many calls pastors get all the time from people who are in crisis when all they need to do is just wait? Just let God do his work. Patience. Bearing with one another. Requires a lot of patience to bear with some people, doesn't it? You can laugh. It's okay. I know how much patience it takes for you to bear with me, Denise. I know that. 38 years worth of it or longer. It takes patience. It takes the character of Christ to bear with some people. But we let our power get out of control to try to fix them. Because they irritate us. It bothers me when certain people do certain things. And I would love to smack them. Be honest, you would too. Don't look at me that way. You've, you've thought about that yourself. Man, if I could just smack them. That's, that's why I'm bald right back here because my wife would do that all the time. She just smacks me. No, she doesn't. <laughs> Edit that out, Bruce. <laughs> it's a standing joke in our family. My wife comes up and whoosh, on the back of my head like that just to get my attention. We bear with one another. And we forgive each other. Not, a way, not the way the world has taught us to forgive. What's the pattern of forgiveness? The way the Lord has forgiven us. Oh man, I wish he wouldn't have said that. I wish he wouldn't have said that. And yet, the fact that he did means that I get to know the heart of God better when I do it. So if I would learn to forgive that way more often, I would know and appreciate a little bit better the forgiveness that God has for me. And then he says this, and above all of these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. This love is a love that is not, I like you, I think you're sweet. Want to go out with me and get something to eat? No, it's not that kind of love. We're talking about the love that surrenders and sacrifices self for the benefit of another person. The kind of love that Jesus had when he gave up his rightful throne in glory to be made as a man, as a human being, and experience all the sin and the bondage of that sin on the cross when God said, Sorry, I can't look at you right now. And Jesus cried out, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus bore our sin, not because he deserved it, but because you and I did, and his compassion overwhelmed him and said, I can't let that happen. I'm going to die in their place so they can live. That's love. Can you imagine what our homes would be like if husbands would love their wives that way? Wives would love their husbands that way? Sacrificing their own desires and their own wishes, not just when it's convenient, but constantly. Love covers all of that, and it's what allows harmony in the home. Well, not only is there a new power to have harmony, but there's also in this a new pattern for the household. Paul lays out the specifics of what the pattern of the household is supposed to be. And we could spend one whole week on each one of these, talking to husbands, talking to wives, talking to children, and talking to parents. We could spend one week on each one of them. I'm going to give you the highlights of what God's laid on my heart and trust that the Holy Spirit is going to expand your understanding and allow you to make proper application. Paul starts by saying there's a pattern for wives. And it's this, be humble, not controlling. Now, if I'd have just put be humble there, some of you might have been happier. But 
But the scripture says, be humble, not controlling. Wives, it's not your responsibility, nor is it your God-given privilege, nor is it some obscure spiritual gift you have to fix your husband. It's not your responsibility. It's your responsibility to fix your own heart before the Lord and let the humility of that heart come out so that your husband sees it and responds with love. You're to be humble. Some of us don't like the word submit, but take it up with God. He chose it. The Greek word to be subject to means to subject oneself. That's interesting. Bible doesn't tell husbands to make sure their wives are submitting. A wife is never told in Scripture to submit out of obligation to a husband. A wife is told to submit out of response to Christ, willingly submitting to her husband. There's a difference. Husbands, it's not your job to create a wife who's willing to submit. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. The word to subject means to subject oneself. It's totally up to you, ladies, whether you'll submit or not. And it has nothing to do with whether your husband is worthy of being subjected to. You know how many divorces would be solved in our country if women got that right? That they never have the right to determine whether or not a husband is worthy to be submitted to? Well, no, I'm not talking about absolute blind unconditional submission that, that robs banks because the husband wants to. I'm not talking about intentionally sinning in order to be submissive. That's not the point. The point is that Paul says, husbands, submit to your wives, rather, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. It's never fitting in the Lord to sin. And sometimes, wives, you have to draw the line because the husband is asking you to do something that is unspiritual, ungodly. But be careful. Make sure the scriptures call it sin before you're determined that it's just ungodly to me. Therefore, I don't have to submit to that. Yes, you do. Because now it's all about the attitude of your heart. Wives, humble yourselves. Don't be controlling. Submission does not imply inferiority. Galatians 3.28 makes that clear that in Christ there is no difference between male and female. Jesus Christ is fully God at all times, an equal part of the Trinity. Some of our kids in our, our morning faith builders time in Bible breakouts are learning about the Trinity. If you missed it, you should come on Sunday mornings. Your kids are getting a good Bible education on Sunday mornings during that 9 o'clock hour. A little plug there for Melinda and all the work that she does. And all these teachers that work so hard to create visuals. I helped my wife create a visual for trying to explain in the concept of a four and five year old what the Trinity might look like. And so we created pyramids out of paper. One side's labeled God, one side's labeled the Holy Spirit, one side's labeled Jesus. It's one pyramid, three different faces to the same pyramid. And yet you take one of the faces away, you no longer have God. Now, it's not a perfect example, but it's a pretty good one. Jesus is fully God. And yet, while he was on the earth, the same word for submit to your husband's wives is used of Jesus submitting to his Father. And yet, he was equal. Totally divine at all times. And yet, he submitted to his Father. It has nothing to do with inferiority has nothing to do with absolute submission to cause you to violate God's law. And finally, the husband's authority is never to be exercised in an authoritative, overbearing manner. Now be careful, women. You don't have the right to determine when your husband is being overbearing. Could be he's just right. Heaven forbid <laughs> that the husband is ever right. Some women, unfortunately, feel that way. 
The wife's submission takes place in the context of a loving, nurturing, caring relationship where she trusts a husband to represent God to her so therefore she can submit to him as she would be submitting to God. That is what's fitting in the Lord. God has a pattern for wives. God has a pattern for husbands as well. He tells them to be patient, not harsh. Be patient, not harsh. In order to do that, the love that a husband has for his wife must be Christ-like. It has to be Christ-like. God designed it so that a wife's submission would operate within the context of love. In that way, she's protected because a man who truly loves her would never force his wife to submit to anything that is humiliating, degrading, or is a violation of her conscience. Did you get that, man? Never are you given permission under the authority of God as the head of your home to ask your wife to submit to anything that is humiliating, degrading, or that violates her conscience. That means you have to know her. You have to know her likes, you have to know her dislikes, and you have to believe that this woman that God gave you is a daughter of the king. And he's entrusted her to you to bring out the richness of the king's creation. Men, do you look at your wives that way? Or do you look at them harshly with bitterness because they're not measuring up to what you thought a wife would be? Or are you looking at them as a gift from God given to you to nurture and to nourish to become ultimately the bride of Christ rather than the fulfiller of all of your sexual fantasies or your financial needs because she's got a good career. Better keep her around. Or is she the one that you're investing God's life in you into so that she becomes the reflection of who God is? Young ladies who are dating right now or not dating yet but going to be, if your man doesn't measure up to this, would you do me a favor right now by the end of the day today? Would you sit down with him and have a long talk and find out if he ever is going to be that man? And if not, then get started with a new relationship. You have the right to have a son of the king treating you like a daughter of the king who understands that you are not his possession but that you are his privilege. And men, become that. Don't be harsh with your wives. The Greek word for harsh there is to mean to be embittered, to be bitter towards them. Do not have the habit, is the tense of the Greek uh, word, do not have the habit of being bitter toward your wife. It's used in Revelation chapter 8 and in chapter 10 to describe something that is bitter in taste. Let me put it very practically for you. Husbands, stop calling your wives honey and then treating her like vinegar. Do not be bitter toward your wife. Do not display harshness. Do not display resentment. Do not allow Satan to get a foothold in your life. Do not irritate them, but provide loving leadership in the home no matter what they do because it's a continuous love if it's Christ-like love. Listen to what John MacArthur says. He says this, the present tense of the imperative Greek word for love, agapate, indicates continuous action. The verb itself seems best understood in the New Testament to express a willing love, not the love of passion or emotion, but the love of choice. It is the word to describe a covenant kind of love. The willing covenant love in view here is the activity of self sacrifice 
MacArthur goes on and says this, it is a deep affection that views the wife as a sister in the Lord and the object of a promise to be kept. Oh, that's good. Husbands, you really did marry your sister. Your sister in the Lord. Do you treat her as such? And do you understand the promise that God has asked you to make to keep her and to build her up? And as Paul says in Ephesians 5, wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. Thought just came to me. I hope it's from the Holy Spirit. I'll know after I say it. If the church doesn't end up being able to be presented to God, holy and pure and chaste, Whose fault is it? It's Christ's, according to that passage. He didn't fulfill his promise. He didn't fulfill his power. He didn't fulfill his word to accomplish his purpose because it says right there that Christ will present the church one day holy and blameless and spotless before the Father in all of its glory. Husbands, don't you represent Christ to your wives? If she's not becoming everything that God said she's supposed to be, whose fault is that? Oh, yeah, it could be hers because she's just rejecting it. But I would guarantee you that 99.9% of the wives in this room right now and the young women who want to be wives want to be everything God wants them to be. Amen? Amen? Women? Amen. Don't you want to represent the glory of God in your life? Okay, husbands, they've just declared that that's who they want to be. Are you participating with God in that process? Are you taking on the responsibility of Christ to them so that you are building them up, sanctifying your wife, cleansing her by the washing of the word every day that you might present to yourself your wife in all of her glory? And if you're embittered toward her right now because she's not measuring up to the glory you think she should have, get on your knees and discover what God said your responsibility is in that and then love her that way. That's God's pattern for husbands. Wow, there's two more yet and it's already five minutes after normal quitting time. Anybody want to leave? Bye. God's pattern for children. God has a pattern for children. Be obedient, not disrespectful. Man, do we have a problem with disrespect of kid, with kids today toward adults. Man, do we have a problem. Anybody agree? Do we have a problem with that? Yeah. yeah. God tells children first to be obedient, but he's going to have a word for you parents too about how to deal with that in a moment. Children are given two responsibilities. Number one, honor your parents. Honor your parents. It's the first commandment with a promise in it in the Old Testament when God said, children, honor your parents so that your days may be long on the earth. Now until you're 18, that's because your parents have the right to take you out. No, I'm just kidding. They don't have the right to do that. (laughs) Just seeing if you're still tracking with me here, if you're still following along. Your days wouldn't be very long on earth if you were that disrespectful all the time, I guarantee you. The disciplinary hand of God is going to make sure that the blessings of life aren't yours if you don't obey his fundamental command for children, obey your parents. But in addition to honoring them, You're supposed to hear and heed their instruction. 
Oh, my dad doesn't give good instructions. It doesn't say that children have the right to evaluate the consistency or the wisdom of what the parents are telling them. It just says, in the Lord, as long as they're not telling them to help them rob banks, you're to obey. And you're supposed to actually listen to godly parents who have been given to you to teach you the truth of God's word, whether you agree with it or not. Obey your parents. Charles Finney, in one of his great sermons, wrote this, Selfishness is a phenomenon of the will and consists in committing the will to the gratification of the personal desires. Selfishness begins when the will yields to the desire and seeks to obey it rather than obeying the law of God. It does not matter what kind of desire it is if it is the desire that governs the will, then it's selfishness. If you allow your desires, kids, let me give you an example. You've all done this, I know. You all have done this. I don't think we have any children in the church named Fred yet, so I'm gonna use Fred for the name so I don't offend anybody. Freddy? You've had enough get video time today. Turn off the Nintendo. No, I, I, gotta, I gotta finish this game. I don't want this guy to die. It'll ruin my score. I gotta. You have just disrespected and disobeyed your parents when you do that. You have just chosen the desire of your heart to dictate your will rather than submitting to the will of your parent. You've just disobeyed God's rules. You've just chosen to step outside of the context of God's blessing for your life and you've said, no, I know better for me than what my parents are telling me right now. I don't care if the timer went off and my four hours of game time today, (laughs) you better not have four hours of game time every day. You better have about 40 minutes and that's about it. And when the parent says the timer is up, guess what? Okay, mom, I know what you do and what dad does for me is best for me. I might not understand it now and the desire of my heart would be to keep playing that game, but I'm gonna obey you first time, every time, all the time. Henry Blackaby told this story. You know who Henry Blackaby is, the author of uh, Experiencing God and great pastor and great teacher. He told this story. The first funeral I ever conducted, he said, was for a beautiful three-year-old girl. Imagine that as a pastor of a church. Your first funeral to conduct is for a three-year-old child. She was the first child born to a family in our church and the first grandchild of the extended family. Unfortunately, she was spoiled and selfish. I visited the little girl's home one day and I observed that she loved to ignore her parents' instructions and do the exact opposite of what they said. When they told her to come, she went. When they said sit down, she stood up. And her parents responded by calling her cute and laughing. One day, their front gate was inadvertently left open and the parents saw their three-year-old child escape out of the yard and head toward the street. They saw the car coming down the street, and as she ran out to the curb between two parked cars, they both screamed at her at the top of their lungs and said, stop, turn around, and come back. She paused for a second, looked back at her parents, giggled, and turned and ran directly into the path of the car and was instantly killed. Now that's not going to happen if you say no to a video game to your parents turning it up to parents saying turn it off and you say no I'm going to play I'm going to finish this game a truck isn't going to drive through your living room or your family room and all of a sudden strike you dead but you know what you're learning a pattern of disrespect for authority that will ultimately take your life it will ultimately take your life obey your parents But God has some pattern for parents, too. He says, Father, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. He says it to fathers only because as the head of the household, the father's there to make sure that the wife and him agree on parenting style. 
and so on. Husbands and wives, if you can't get this straight, come in for counseling right away, will you please? Because you have to agree on how you're parenting your children. And God challenges the father to be the one that's responsible for that ultimately of how you're going to do it. God's word is pretty practical, isn't it, if we just look at it and are opening our hearts to it? And he tells parents to be encouraging, not exasperating. To be encouraging, not exasperating. I'm going to give you four quick principles that parents, I want you to begin to learn to evaluate and apply. First of all, learn to communicate without control. Learn to communicate without control. If you have to say, go clean your room or else, the or else is control. Learn to communicate without control. Freddie, do you understand why we've told you that you only get 40 minutes a day of video time of any kind, whether it's TV or Game Boy or, or DS3 or whatever it is, you get 40 minutes a day of video time total. You can choose how to use it. You can watch it. You can watch TV, unless it's a family event that we plan and we're going to watch a movie together or our dad's going to sit down and play a game with you. Personal screen time, you get 40 minutes a day. I'm, I'm not just throwing that figure out. I'm telling you there's psychological value to understanding the worth of having only 40 minutes a day. And that as a parent, I know it's inconvenient to be creative enough to find other things for your kids to do, but 40 minutes a day, and then create other things for them to do and get involved in your kids' lives. Do you sit down and communicate with them? Here's why. Age appropriately, this is what we're trying to accomplish in your life. And here's the benefits for you, and communicate that. But you don't communicate by going, I told you to turn that off! There's trouble coming. Now you're trying to control behavior, but you're not communicating to teach them the value of making good decisions. Secondly, correction without criticism. Ooh, this is a tough one. How to correct your kids without criticizing your kids. That's tough to learn. Now, I, I told you that if you didn't shut that off right away, you knew the rule. We established the rule. It may even be written on the rule board in the back of the pantry door or the kitchen cupboard or wherever you have it in your house that these are the rules of the house, these are the consequences. What, what does it say the consequence is if you don't obey the rule? You went 43 minutes, and I told you at 39 minutes to get ready to shut it off, and you went three extra minutes over time. What's the consequence? Well, I lose the DS for a week. Okay. Hand over the DS, you little snot. The little snot comment is criticism, right? You got to learn to correct without destroying the spirit of the child so they see a benefit in the correction. Learn to correct without criticism. A child learns what he lives. If he lives with criticism, he does not learn responsibility. Psychological study I found that proved this. If he lives with criticism, he does not learn responsibility. Do you understand that? You want your kids to be more responsible? Stop criticizing them. He learns to condemn himself because others are condemning him. He learns to find fault with himself because others are finding fault with him. Therefore, he learns to doubt his own judgment, to doubt his own ability, and to distrust anybody else's intention in his life. And above all, he learns to live with the continual expectation of impending doom. All because parents criticize their kids. Yep, the home needs help. The home needs hope. We need the pattern of Jesus Christ. Two more things quickly. We need to learn to give compliments without comparisons. Oh, I'm so glad you're learning to do that like your older brother did. <laughs> Stop it. 
Compliments are of their own merit for, their own, for the own person. You do not give a compliment and then totally subject that compliment to the, the, the attack of Satan in that kid's life by saying, well, I did it good, but it's only because I measured up to how somebody else did it. They obviously think more of that person than they think of me. Stop giving compliments with comparisons. It has nothing to do with how it measures up to anybody else. Oh, if only you could just study as hard as your older brother did in school and you'd get good grades too. (sighs) Want to destroy your kid's academic career? Keep telling them that. Because they believe they will never measure up. And then finally, learn to give care without conviction. Parents, learn to give care without conviction. What do I mean by that? Think of conviction the right way. Don't add a convicting spirit to a caring heart. Mom, I'm hungry. All right, I guess I'll stop what I'm doing right now and go fix you some lunch. Huh? Your caring and compassion has just been totally obliterated from having any value in that child's life because you made them understand that it's a strain and a stress for you to take care of them. Parents, are you encouraging your children by caring for them without conviction, without adding guilt or shame to it? Be encouraging. Don't be exasperating. Now, the scriptures tell me that if we let this inner transformation of our hearts start to take effect in our relationships in our home, there's hope for the home. There's hope. And your home can get better as long as you allow the character of Christ to come out of you. Let's pray. Father, thank you uh, that we're going to uh, have your Holy Spirit taking some of these things and adding to them. And thanks for people's patience this morning on this special day with a missionary guest. We pray for Brian and his family and his work and your Holy Spirit to just explode salvation in, in these criminals, in these uh, uh, people who are incarcerated in their lives and that your Holy Spirit can change them and give them that inner transformation. Thank you for our veterans and how we honored them today. And thank you for how we spent time just worshiping you for having paid it all, all the time. And now, Lord, we just uh, commit our lives to letting this word, these truths of family life, sink in to us, not just from a head knowledge where we're going to argue them over lunch today, but where we're going to trust your Holy Spirit to transform us to become parents husbands, wives, and children just like that because it's fitting in the Lord to be that way. Let us rejoice for a moment in who you are and give you praise as we leave today. Amen. Please stand. Thank you for your word this morning. The conviction of the Holy Spirit, Father God, we thank you for that. Sometimes we think it just overwhelms us. And it's hard to change. But Father, in Revelation, you say you make all things new. So Father, make us new this morning. There's nowhere we can go that you won't shine. Redemption's light. Our guilt withdrawn as you rise. We come alive. It is the grave. Lost the old has gone in your.
making all things new. That's right. You are making all things new. You are making all things new. We are free. We are free, Father. A hope is found. You are here, Lord. You're in this place. Our hearts forever see by this love the King for us. Now we are yours. Father, I just want to pray over this congregation right now as we think about the words of that song. I want to pray over children. That they will seek Jesus and be obedient to their parents and be respectful. I want to pray over wives, that they will discover the incredible power of Jesus to have a humble heart toward a husband even when her flesh tells her he doesn't deserve it. I want to pray over husbands who will have a loving spirit of Christ toward their wives even when he doesn't believe she's earned it. And I want to pray for parents that they will never again see children as an inconvenience or as something to be controlled that they will be encouragers and uplifters of their spirit so they become like Jesus because they see it in them. I want to pray that the families of this church will be made new in Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for watching and hope you got connected to God. You can reach us at 715-832-6363 or on the web at www.calvaryoclair.org. And feel free to join us at our worship services Sunday mornings at 10.15 a.m. in our new handicapped accessible facility. Thank you.